The confiscation is always a risk, and it's a reason to have some diversity of where you have your holdings. I mean, we get into a lot of philosophical and political discussions here. I mean, it would be a lot of boating accidents. And I think if uh, you know, if people said if they went to confiscate, I think there are a lot of heavily armed people who might say, "Well, I lost mine in a boating accident." Um, let's go to the Volcker question first. I mean, what tools do they have? I suppose they could. And they could threaten to confiscate. They could threaten to heavily tax. And they could try to discourage. I mean, let me say this, because I also said this in my letter. I think for a while, they're on our side. Okay. In other words, I think the people who run the show, you know, at the Fed level are smart enough to know that they absolutely have to have inflation. The whole thing's going to crater. So my sense is very much like in 09 and 010, they've got much bigger fish to fry than the gold price right now. I mean, they, they probably want a higher gold price. They want to have some inflation. They want to see the economy keep going. They want to see the stock market keep going up. And in other words, in fact, I think the, the S&P is a national policy tool. I think the S&P, you know, like I mean, I've come to see it the way Luke Roman sees it, which is we can't have the S&P decline or else the economy is going to go tapioca. And so my belief is that they want to see a higher price for a while. Now, what they don't want to see is a runaway price. They don't want to see Gresham's Law kicking in in spades, which is frankly why watching what's going on right now gives me a little bit of concern because I would prefer that we just got a nice orderly growth in the price, you know, year on year. You know, Alistair McLeod, who does a great job on Twitter talking about this, he thinks this whole thing will be over in six months. He thinks, you know, we've got kind of a John Law-like environment, and in six months the whole thing will be over and the dollar will be worthless. I think that's possible. I don't think it's likely, but I think it's possible. I think there's a chance they'll threaten at confiscation. I think there's a chance they'll threaten at a Bitcoin-like solution or a, a Fedcoin-like solution. I think there's a chance that they'll maybe talk about a restructuring or some kind of a debt jubilee. And all of these things could be rather turbulent for the gold price. But in general, I don't think they can kill it. Um, even if they confiscate it, they'd have to pay you, you know, the going price for it. And I think it's a small enough percentage of total assets out there that they're not likely to go for because confiscating what people don't have doesn't really solve the problem. So, you know, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, what all the tools are. You know, they can't do Operation Twist. Operation Twist was how they got us in 2011. I mean, we had them on the run in 2011. I mean, gas in Massachusetts was $4, silver was 50 bucks, gold was 1900 They realized that all the money they created in 2008 was a problem. And so, you know, they had a big meeting in D.C. Goldman Sachs came out with a big negative to port on gold. They got all their friends heavily shorted, you know, and then they went out and they just hammered it. I mean, they and I watched it because I was in it and they were trading such enormous blocks in 2011 that there's no way there's no investment firm big enough to trade those kind of futures blocks. The only people who could have been doing that were the central banks. It was the only people. And they did it to correspond with Operation Twist, which was when they basically went from a you know, the long bond was at like four and a half, and that's the biggest indicator of future inflation. And so they knew they had to kill it. And so they did twist, which was diabolical. I mean, they basically sold treasuries and used them to buy long treasuries. And they brought the long bond yield from you know, foreign change down into the you know low twos, as I recall. So that was a diabolical move. And that put the kibosh on the gold price at the time. And then it allowed them to create another credit cycle. And of course, when a credit cycle is going up, nobody needs gold. And so everyone switched over and, and started buying the fangs in you know, 2011, 12, and 13, and they got this everything bubble going. So can they do all those things again? I don't know, maybe, but we're at kind of the ultimate level. I mean, first it was dot-coms. They re-blew that one with housing. Then it was housing, and now they re-blew that one with the sovereign credit level. I mean, what's the next level up? I mean, we're going to be saved by you know, Jupiter and Mars? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a next level, another bubble to be blown. But can they make it messy in the interim? Oh, yeah, I'm sure they can. But I'm hanging on to my coins, and I'm hanging on to my gold stocks. And if they go to grab the coins, the stocks will do very well. I mean, one thing to consider in the 30s, they grabbed the coins, but the stocks were a 10-bagger in the 30s. And that was the big stocks. The little stocks were probably 20 or 30-baggers. They don't really record all those. It's hard to get the data from back in the 30s. But it's valuable stuff, and 6 billion people know that it's valuable stuff. And there are a lot more of us than there are of them. You know, the powers that be, I mean, we all sit here and quake at, you know, what the Fed and the government can do, but it's really a small group of people. And when the currency starts to become worthless, people are going to be pissed off, and rightly so, and they're going to be really pissed off. You know, I like the hand we're holding a lot more than the hand they're holding. I think they're screwed. I mean, I think they're absolutely screwed, but we'll have to see. I mean, it, it could be a very rocky and rough road. And frankly, uh, that wouldn't surprise me, and I'm kind of used to it. It's a very volatile space, but that's what happened. And this is the danger. I mean, what these people are doing 
is absolutely criminal. When you play with the value of the money, you're really playing with fire and you can destroy a society this way. You know, Lenin said it, you know, Rothschild said it, you know, give me control of the money. I don't, I don't care about the law. You really are playing with fire. And um, I think we're going to end up back on a gold standard. I don't think we're going to end there necessarily because enlightened people in our governments are going to take us there. I think the odds of that are pretty low. But I think we're going to end there because once this currency is worthless, everybody's going to realize nobody's going to ever trust fiat currency again. And, it's, you know, we're going to go back to first principles, which are gold and silver or money. They were naturally selected that way as a result of 5,000 years of history. So I think that's where we'll end up. And therefore, having coins, having things related to gold would be you know, a very wise thing to have done in terms of protecting your wealth. I mean, Egon von Dreyeritz has done a great job of saying this for 20 or 30 years. Others have too. I mean, Peter Schiff, there are a lot of people who totally understand it and have been out there talking about it. And of course, we were all branded as crazy for many, many years, but we're not going to look so crazy here. We're starting to not look crazy now. And in a couple of years, I think we're going to look absolutely brilliant. And we're not as brilliant as we'll look, but we weren't as stupid as we looked in 2015. <laughs> There's got to be some midpoint in there. And, and I sincerely hope that it doesn't have to get ugly and nasty. And I mean, one thing, I mean, everyone says, well, look, this is going to be horrible. How can you be rooting for this? I'm not rooting for it. I'm just observing it, one. And two, I've actually studied enough of these cases that if we don't get into a big shooting war, if we don't kill a bunch of people, once you restore sound money, things actually go back to normal pretty damn quickly. I've read everything there is to read on Weimar. And this guy, Shaq, who came in after the thing collapsed, put him back on a gold standard. They tested him a few times. He held firm. And bang, the whole economy just got going again. Now, they were so pissed off and angry, they elected Hitler. But that's a different problem. The monetary shit can be solved. If we go back to sound money, if this thing collapses and Judy Schoen says, OK, look, we've got to have a sound currency here. We're going to follow the Constitution. It's going to be X grains of silver, whatever it might be. We can recover. And by the way, everyone's going to be in the soup. You know, the other countries are going to have the same problems. I mean, all these currencies are going to collapse. But when we go back to sound money, I think we'll be stunned at how quickly, with all the technology we have and the self-organizing society we have, I think we could be stunned at how quickly things get good again. And that's kind of what I care about because I'm worried about my kids and my grandkids. You know, I'm 63. I mean, whatever. You know, I can't complain with the way my life has gone. But I care a lot about how my kids' lives are going to be. And I think the sooner we get the sound money, the sooner we're going to have a foundation on which I think we can build good lives. You know, to the degree that I make money on this thing, I mean, I've, I've already committed. I'm going to spend a lot of that or some piece of that on arguing for a sound money standard. I think it's the biggest thing that we've got wrong in the society right now. If you take fiat currency down to zero, the people who own gold and silver are going to have a lot of marbles. You were saying you own coins, but you also own stocks. So maybe tell us a little bit about emerging producers, how to identify them, and why they kind of present a very asymmetric gain opportunity in this. In this, uh... Sure. I'd be happy to do it. I mean, so first of all, everyone should understand that stocks are risky, okay? I mean, for people who don't know what they're doing and haven't invested in stocks before, you know, you can hear all kinds of, please, buy this hot stock tip. And I mean, the Robin Hood crowd's going to come in here and... You're going to see some of these things doing moonshots. Everyone's going to be talking about how easy it is, and nothing could be further from the truth. So, you know, I mean, part one, I mean, anyone who's buying stocks, if they don't have some coins in front of that, they're nuts. you got to start off with some savings, okay? you got to have some coins that you know are going to hold their value because everyone needs a base of savings. Okay. Before we continue, help us by smashing that YouTube like button and subscribe now to this channel. This shows the algorithm that you value the information, and it helps us spread this message. Sharing is caring. Please like and subscribe now. Thank you. And now, let's continue. Fine. You got your savings. Now you got some money, and you're thinking, all right, I'd like to see this grow. You know, the coins are just going to sit there, and I'm not going to have sex and multiply. They're just going to sit in your vault, and they're going to grow in value on a relative basis, but they don't grow otherwise. Okay, so now you want an asset that will grow in value potentially because it's going to do something constructive. As Buffett says, gold is a goose that doesn't lay eggs. Well, okay, the stocks do lay eggs because they grow their production and so forth. Okay, within the stocks, in my opinion, you see this in my writings, my opinion is that the sweet spot is what I call the emerging producers. And these are companies that have a mind. I mean, Backing up for a second, there, there are three kinds of stocks. They're drill stories. They're the most exciting. You know, they're going to they're going to do moonshots or crater. That's it's gambling. Um, you can do it. I do some of them, but you got to be careful. The average person shouldn't be doing drill stories. Producers are, are, are you know, uh, development stories are people who have a deposit and they're going to try and build a mine. Not quite as risky as a drill story because at least they have a deposit, but still risky because they got to get the mine built. The, the third thing are producers. Okay. Within the producers, you've got big, medium, and small. 
big, barbaric, and Numa, very safe, um, lots of diversity, but very hard to grow production and very fully priced. So when the big money comes in, it'll initially go to those names, but it takes a lot of money to move those names. I mean, Barrick and Newmont have market caps of $46 billion, and it can take a lot of money to move the stocks up. Below them, you've got another whole class of miners, which I call emerging producers. These companies have found a deposit and built a mine and built a processing plant, and they are actually pulling ore out of the ground and generating positive cash flow. And so what you've got in these companies is three ways to make money. You can make money in the following ways. One, the price of gold goes up, so the margin goes up. Okay, that's item one. Two, they produce more ounces over time. And this is why I say emerging producers. You know, they may have one mine, they're building a second mine, they're increasing capacity at their first mine, so that maybe they're producing 100,000 ounces today, and in the future they're going to produce 200,000 ounces. So all other things being equal, they're going to double their cash flow. I mean, Barrick does 5 million ounces a year. They're struggling to maintain 5 million ounces a year. There's no way Barrick is going to produce 10 million ounces any time in the next 5 or 10 years. There's just no way. It's physically impossible, okay? Yet, I've got a lot of companies in the portfolio that are going to go from 100,000 ounces to 200,000 ounces. So, they grow production. The third way they grow in value is their multiple expands, okay? So, what you do is you look at what are you paying as a multiple of cash flow, So how do you find these companies? You go out and you look at all the gold mining companies and you start by screening for which ones are making positive cash flow. If they're not making positive cash flow, they don't qualify. Okay. Then you look at, is that cash flow growing over time? And is it growing either based on higher price of gold or is it growing based on production growth? And so you can find how many ounces they're producing, how many they intend to produce in the future and where they're going there. And so that's useful data. And, you know, no guarantees about future production, but over time, you get who's got a reputation for doing what they say they're going to do, et cetera. Then what you can do is you can say, all right, let's look at this and say, all right, this company is producing this amount, and at $1,000 ASIC and an $1,800 gold price, they're making $800 per ounce of production, and they're producing 100,000 ounces a year. Ah, bingo. You know, at a mine level, they've got $80 million of cash flow. Now they've got sustaining CapEx to maybe grow the deposit. They've got SG&A and so forth below that, and they might have financing charges, whatever. But you can develop a kind of a free cash flow number coming out of that company. Then you can compare that to the market cap. And if you do this for Barrick or Newmont, you'll find that, you know, it's you're paying something like 10, 12, 15 times. And some of the really sexier ones like Kirk and Lake, you know, or, or West Dome, you're up around 15 times cash flow. A lot of the ones I'm involved with, you're trading at kind of four to five times cash flow. So multiple expansion is when that small company gets bigger, better known, and people trust it more. And they're like, you know, this doesn't deserve a single mine discount. or This doesn't deserve a jurisdictional discount that it's got. Instead of trading at 4x cash flow, this thing should trade at 8x cash flow. And so all other things being equal, you've got to double in the stock just based on multiple expansion. So think about it. If you can get all three of these things lined up, the price of gold might go up their production might go up and their multiple might expand. Bingo. That's your sweet spot, right? You're looking for those three things. And that's what I do with my fund. That's why my fund doubled the GDXJ numbers last year. And I'm kind of doubling year to date so far. I've been doubling them this year. And I just, basically, that's what I do. I pick the companies that meet those three criteria and I leave the other ones for the index guys to buy. But, you know, you can do this at home. You don't need me. It's a pretty simple formula, and it works really well right now because these juniors have been left for dead. I mean, we're coming out of a – it was a big bear market from 2011 to 2016. We got a bump up in 2016, but then we fell back down in 17 and 18. And 19, don't get me wrong, we started to go up. I mean, we're clearly – I mean, I'm, I was up 100% last year, and right now, year to date this year, I just did it this morning, I'm up about 70%. But, you know, the numbers – we've still got a long ways to run. There's a chart in my report which shows that a lot of these gold bull markets, when they hit these stocks, you get 5, 6, 7x your money. And we've kind of done 1.5 to 2x if you kind of look at the index averages. So, so there's still room left. I mean, we're not at the end of it. I mean, I'd say we're in the third inning, maybe the second inning. It kind of depends on where the gold price goes. So people who are thinking about getting into it, I don't think you're too late. Having said that, having a 20 or 30% pull down in these stocks is like, you know, an everyday occurrence. So you might find one of these things I've just described, buy it right now when we've actually are pretty overbought, frankly, then suddenly you get a 30% drawdown and it's like, holy shit, I screwed up. Well, no, you didn't. You might have not bought at the most opportune time. And so the way I think you address that, or I would recommend a friend's address this, and I was talking to my sister about this actually the other day, I said, you got a dollar cost average. You know, you just got to say, all right, I want to put this amount into these things and they're going to go up and down. And, you know, I'm going to buy four equal amounts for the next four months. 
And, you know, if we have a pull down, well, then I'll get a little more. And if it runs away from me, well, at least I made money on the first piece I bought. So they are volatile and people should be aware of that. It's not easy. But I think assuming the gold price is going higher, which I strongly believe is true, and if you do analysis and come to that conclusion, then I think you can rest comfortably that if you buy, even if you get that 30% drawdown, you know, we are in a bull market for this stuff and standard operating procedure in a bull market is you buy the dip. So, you know, you leave yourself some dry powder, you buy some today, you get your drawdown, you buy the dip, and then when it comes back, you're glad you did. And your first piece comes back and even and you made money on the, you made money on the dip that you bought. Excuse me, Mitch. So that's kind of how I approach it, and that's what I would recommend people do. But everybody has to look at their own situation, and everybody has to recognize that these do have risk. And there have been times when the results in these things have been brutal. I mean, if you look at my results, which are right published on my quarterly report, from 2011 to 2016, I mean, I stunk up the joint. I did terribly. I mean, I did better than the averages, but I did terribly. I mean, I lost a lot of money. You know, it's the timing on this kind of stuff on, on gold. I mean, 80% of the time, gold and gold stocks are not a good place to be investing. But in times when there are sovereign debt crises and in times when there are credit bubble collapses, both of which I believe are going on right now, they happen to be extremely good places to be invested. And so, you know, you've got to make your own decision on where are we in that cycle. And if you believe, as I do, that we're in a very opportune part of that cycle, then I think we're going to make some serious money here in the next few years. You know, obviously, you can only be comfortable doing it if you believe those things. What to do in such a situation? Inform yourself and keep your financial education strong. We from the Compact Group offer our loyal subscribers a free educational portal with firsthand monetary, financial, and economic knowledge. Enter our invite-only Insider Club by clicking the link below. You will get access to first-class information far earlier than the rest. We have prepared a special deal for all our members where you can access a giant pool of Robert Kiyosaki's financial wisdom for just $1. To find out more, simply click the link below and join our Insider Club absolutely free. But there is more you can and should do. Build up several streams of income. More and more people realize that they have to take their future in their own hands, but they don't know how and where to start. We from Compact offer our Insider Club members unique opportunities. Strengthen your financial muscle and get the edge. Click the link below. Become part of our free Insider Club. No financial obligations. But there's one important thing you have to know. You have to become active. So do it now. Become active and see you on the other side.